Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about autism stories. On today's episode, Ryan Walsh joins me to discuss Autistic Joy, Facilitating an Autistic Support Group for Men, and Podcast Production. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Ryan, thanks so much for joining me here today on Autism Stories. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to get into it. Absolutely. And um, just learning a little bit about your story, where would you say um, it starts in the autistic community? I guess it starts when I was diagnosed, and maybe even before then. I was diagnosed when I was in the third grade. But I think that it was pretty apparent, like even in my very young years, that I was pretty different than my peers. I also had like other mental health complications that were alongside it. So like I was already interacting with like mental health system and other kinds of systems from a pretty young age. So then through that, autism kind of followed after that. Mm-hmm. And then um, from that point on, I was doing, I think when I turned 13, I started to do speaking events with a and and I was doing them ever since until I graduated college, and now I'm an employee at a and You have a bachelor's degree in sociology. I think for a very brief period of time, that was my major in college. I, I switched majors five different times. <laughs> Don't recommend that one to anyone. But uh, what is it about you know sociology that made you want to study it in depth? Yeah, so uh, it's actually really interesting because even from like a younger age, I was always like really interested in like learning about people and just like human like I was just really interested in like humans human behavior and so at first I wanted to go the anthropology route and then I went to college and I had to take a freshman seminar and the person who ran the freshman seminar class was the uh, chair of the sociology department at that college they were just talking about like concepts that were just like really really clicking in my brain and making me happy and they were like giving me the source of like all that knowledge that I was looking for that I didn't really know at the time, because I knew that sociology was a thing, but I didn't really understand what it was or like how it worked until I got into that space. And then I got like hooked on it. I was like, this is the thing that I've been looking for. And then, yeah, I got really interested into it and I decided to make it my major pretty much immediately. What were some of those things that like made you really happy that he was talking about? Yeah, it was, I think that a lot of it was like the different sociological perspectives. So like symbolic interactionism, structural functionalism and like different lenses that people use to analyze like large macro scale of society like that's kind of like how my brain works i'm like a very macro oriented zoomed out kind of person and like giving these like research oriented tools to like view society in this very like macro you know wide lens and then like being able to go from the general to the particular using like research methods and like being able to arrive at conclusions about groups of people like using an actual process like made me very happy it's always nice to have a process or system it always makes me feel a lot better yeah and i think it's fair to people too because like i think that you know in order to avoid like uh, because i'm somebody maybe this is like my autism showing right but like i think that like in order to be fair to people i think that like we have to be very specific and very like you know we have to really do our research when we make generalizations about people And I was always somebody growing up who was like, you know, you can't make generalizations about this group of people. You can't say that about this group of people or whatever. And being able to say, okay, well, what can we say about people? Like that made me really happy. Now, present day, you're um, employed by AANE, the Asperger Autism Network. And um, not long ago, you co-led a celebration of autistic joy, um, one of my favorite uh, topics to discuss. So What does uh, autistic joy mean to you? So to me, autistic joy is kind of like about authenticity and being able to express joy in like a way that is comfortable and unique 
to oneself. But I think that there's also kind of like this added like autism layer to it because everybody wants the opportunity to be authentically joyful in the way that they would like to be. But I think that the added autism layer to it is that the joy may present differently or the joy may be about different things than neurotypical people. And I think that that kind of joy should be celebrated. And I think that internally within an autism culture, I think that that joy should also be celebrated internally and shared with each other. Because a lot of the time, I think autistic people can feel very isolated. I know I feel isolated sometimes. And I think that when we can come together and share those joyful things, it makes us feel a bit less alone. And it's just overall, I think, just a really positive experience to be able to share that with other people and kind of like stop the masking, you know, whenever we would like to. Now, the uh, co-leader of that celebration is a good friend of mine, the wonderful Becca Laurie Hector. Uh, so from what I understand, Becca's your supervisor. And I'm wondering if in any ways, how has having an autistic supervisor impacted you? It's actually been really interesting because I've never had an autistic supervisor before, at least that I'm aware of. And, and also like being in this environment where like we can be really open about it and that's like included in our work and in our dialogue is something that is really special. I think that me and Becca kind of have an understanding of how we like to communicate with each other. We can kind of cut through some of the stuff that, you know, in a normal workplace would be, I guess, more like common. Like me, me and her can kind of just like, you know, when we're in a meeting, we can kind of just communicate very directly and very clearly in a way that I don't think I've been able to communicate with other supervisors. And I think that also just like un having an understanding of each other's boundaries, I think is really important too, because like we're able to like articulate those and kind of relate to each other again in a way that I don't think I've been related to before. And so th that feels very positive for sure. Becca will definitely be direct and she will definitely be authentic with you. Absolutely. And I appreciate that 100% because it's just how I, it's how I like to interact as well. It's much appreciated whenever me and her get the chance to talk. Part of your work with a and &E, you are the facilitator for a new support group for men 18 to 30 years old. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about the structure of the group and what do you hope this group evolves into? I think so. I run two groups, actually. My first group that I run is an open support group where kind of anybody can join. It's pretty open, like, you know, any random person can kind of just show up. And what I try to do in that group is I try to create a space where people can come, you know, one time, they can return. Like we have some people who just come in once, they want to share one or two things. Maybe they don't want to share anything at all and they just want to listen. I, I try to create a space where people can use it how they feel comfortable using it. Uh, you know, I don't mandate that anybody like turn on their camera. I don't say that anybody has to talk. I want it to be just like a really chill and inclusive like space where somebody can just kind of come in and access support or maybe just hear feedback. Or if a person is questioning whether they're autistic or if a person is autistic and maybe they want to get feedback from other people in a safe and contained environment, that's kind of like what I go for with that group. I think since it's an open group, there's not much of like an evolution path for it because the people in it are changing constantly. But I think that I would like to grow as a facilitator and as a moderator for those groups. Because even though I've been in this space for a good amount of time and I've been doing my own presentations and stuff, I my groups have been going pretty well. I do think I still have a lot to learn in that regard. And then for my other group, I actually co-facilitate with one of my coworkers, Bob Waters. and. That's a closed group where we have the same people coming. And what we do there is we kind of like select topics weekly and the different group members discuss those topics. And usually there's support related topics, but we also do topics like self-interest or like relationships or, you know, just like sometimes we just have like chill conversations. Like I know next week we're talking about like music and just like what kinds of music we like because we have like a few musicians in the group. And I think that with closed groups, we, you kind of get more of that opportunity for evolution because what you can do is like kind of like take the group on a particular path and like have like a cumulative discussion. And my thing is, is I always want to make sure that people are accessing the support that they need. I like to create environments where people feel heard. So I think that the evolution for that group is really about just creating, just making the space more inclusive and making it more equitable and more fair so that way everybody can share equally and everybody can 
we can get into like a more depth of experience because I think that's a lot of the people that we have in our groups really are looking for that depth of connection and depth of experience and like really detailed feedback that they don't always get the opportunity to have like outside of the context of a support group. I think that's kind of like, I know it's like a long answer, but that's kind of how I want to, that's how I'm like viewing my groups right now. Long answers were built for podcasts. (laughs) (laughs) True, true. You know, talking about podcasts away from AANE, I understand you've been um, highly involved in podcast production for a while now. So I'm really interested to learn as someone who's uh, been hosting podcasts for about five years now. So what are your tips on improving podcast production? Because, you know, always getting um, feedback on, can you change this about the sound? Can you change that? Like, what do you think makes a podcast production a good quality? So I think that I've definitely been mostly on the production side. This is actually the first time I've ever come on a podcast, even though I've like worked on one. The podcast that I worked on was actually my mom's podcast, and it is an autism-related podcast called Autism in Real Life. And I was doing like all of the audio production. And I think that what makes a good production honestly is just not actually doing too much to the signal like went to the different audio signals like I think that a lot of it is just like trying to record it as well as you can at its source so like that means like using like a good microphone or even if you don't have a good microphone like you could use like apple earbuds and like wear headphones something to like eliminate the sound of the room like I noticed like you have a pretty quiet room you have a pretty like you know pretty direct voice like I can think about like what I would do if I was going to edit your voice, but like, I, yeah, I think that a lot of it has to do with not, I I try not to do a lot of editing. I mostly like cut out like some of the, like the really low end and the really high end on people's voices because not, not everybody's listening to it on good speakers. And then what I try to do is I try to make sure that the volume and the gain is like at a particular level and is constant across. And then sometimes I do like compression and stuff. I don't know how much you want me to like get into it, get into, get it, into all of it. I want like, maybe the I, listeners don't yeah, care, but I yeah. want to hear every last second of this. <laughs> yeah. I, so like what I usually do is I do I use a DAW. So like when I take the uh, audio files from the source wherever it's being recorded, my mom was using Riverside, so I would download the files from Riverside and I would download those, I would put them in my DAW and I would apply an EQ. And I would try to, because most people are not using very good microphones. Mm -hmm. And instead of like trying to go to them and say like, oh, you need to use a good microphone. You need to wear headphones, like whatever. Like, I don't think that's not a good strategy, right? Right. So like what you do is I try to bring up the parts of the voice that sound good and eliminate the parts of the voice that are like electrical noise or whatever. Another thing that's really good is to use like analyzer, like a, uh, a spectrograph and like select a noise and then you can say, okay, computer, this is a noise. And then you tell it to eliminate that noise throughout the entire signal. So like, let's say somebody has a hum in the background. You can like select that little piece and you can tell the computer that that's a hum and it will get rid of that hum throughout the entire audio file. Or like, let's say somebody has a fan spinning, you can eliminate that or whatever. But other than that, I just try to do e- But like for most people who just have like decent mics, they're using like a, you know, they're using like Apple earbuds or whatever. What I usually do is I just try to take out the parts of the voice that sound good cut out the, a little bit of the low end, cut out a little bit of the high end and do a little bit of compression and like keep the volume steady. And I think that that kind of stuff, and again, like I know that sounds like a lot, but really just like doing as little as possible, I think is good as so long as it sounds good. Because I think that we've all heard a podcast that has like this super overproduced like audio where it's like, yeah, you know, like it doesn't even sound like there's a real person on the other side. They sound like a you know, like some like ASMR announcer or something, <laughs> you know, I like to just keep my personal approaches. I just like to have the voices be as natural as I can have it be. So did you just self teach yourself these things? Or how did you kind of get in into this production aspect? So I do music production. And that's mostly that's mostly just like online production. Like I'm not doing a ton of like recording of instruments or anything. I'm usually just using like virtual instruments or like drum, like, you know, virtual drum sounds and things like that. And I learned a lot about EQ and like just general principles of like mixing and loudness, like from doing that. 
when my mom decided she wanted to do a podcast, I was like, well, I'll just do that. I'll do the editing for you. And then I was like, oh, well, I can do it. I mean, it's just a voice. And then I was like, oh, it's not just a voice. It's actually pretty hard. And then I ended up having to learn some stuff. So I watched YouTube. I also just kind of tried to use my ears as much as I could. Like the principle in music is trust your ears more than anything else. And so I just, I kind of tried to do that. But I got into it through music mainly. And uh, lastly, how can our listeners learn about you and AANE beyond uh, this interview? Well, so you can definitely go to the AANE website. You can, you know, look on our homepage. I think that you can probably, our website's undergoing a little bit of a redo. Our website's kind of a little bit of a mess, unfortunately. But if you look on our Speakers Bureau page, you can find like my bio and who I am. And then you can also find our other speakers that we have on our Speakers Bureau. You can also go to AE events page and you can look for some of the events that we host. You can also find events that I've hosted in the past and you can access those on Vimeo or on YouTube. We're also working, a and is working on a YouTube channel right now. Um, we do a live stream once a month and we are also trying to upload like a lot more videos. Some of those are going to be educational. Some of those are going to be like autism cultural type pieces. Some of those are going to be just more like exploratory and like more free form. We're trying to like upload more content from a lot of different angles. So you can definitely check that out. And I think as far as I go, I mean, it's kind of hard because I actually don't really use social media that much. I can't be like, hey, this is my social media or whatever. I wish I could, but that's pretty much what I got. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ryan, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for making the time to talk with me today. Yeah, th again, thank you for having me. You know, I really appreciate you reaching out to me and giving me the opportunity to, to talk on the show. It's, it's great. Thanks so much to Ryan for the conversation. To learn more about Ryan a and AANE, check out the link in the podcast description of this episode. Here at Autism Personal Coach, our clients are the experts. Our coaches are the guides. The majority of supports for our autistics are not helpful. They try to fix us, not support us. That's why many are confused when we say our clients are the experts, experts of their lived experience. Our clients are the experts for what's worked for them and about the things they need and want in their lives. Our coaches first listen to the clients and then ask questions, offer resources, and strategize with our clients so they can get what they need to thrive. Would you want a guide in your life to coach you to get, get you the things you desire? If so, then visit AutismPersonalCoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable and educational experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, it would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.